Hey everyone, welcome back to Policy Punchline. Here at the show, we interview scholars, policymakers, and business executives about some of the most urgent issues and frontier ideas in our world today. I'm Princeton senior Tiger Gao. I'm here with my co-host Owen Engel. Uh, Owen, would you like to introduce our guest today? Yes, absolutely. So I'm really excited about our guest today. We have Dr. Sunita Satyapal, who is the director of the U.S. Department of Energy's Hydrogen and Fuel Cell Technologies Office within the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy. Hydrogen has been getting a lot of buzz lately, and Dr. Satyapal is responsible for the overall strategy and execution of hydrogen and fuel cell activities for the DOE, including oversight and coordination of about 150 million per year of research and development programs. Dr. Satyapal, thank you for being here with us today. So the first question that I would love to ask is about your background. So you've held multiple roles in academia, in industry, and now in government. So how did your career lead you to this great world of hydrogen energy? And um, what do you think about it today versus when you first started? Well, thanks for the question, uh, Owen and Tiger. It's great to, to be here. Thanks for doing this. And it's true, I have done a lot of different things. Um, and I would say that, you know, I've been in uh, government now um, almost 17 years. And before that, I was in industry, I was in academia. I originally uh, thought I wanted to be a professor. In fact, I did start out as a professor after my, um, my PhD from Columbia University. And um, then I went on to industry. I think, you know, HAP was really one of the major drivers. Things have changed a lot in terms of, of hydrogen. Um, I know you were also asking about, you know, career advice in general, since, um, you know, maybe you have a student population there. And so I would say, you know, don't be afraid to try different things. So, you know, I moved around a lot and I've been the director now for about a decade here. Um, and going back, though, um, you know, things have changed so much. You have no idea where you could end up. Um, but I do want to say that I, I really, you know, owe a lot to my, my parents. My mother is a physics professor. Um, she got her PhD in physics in the 1960s, which was unusual at that time for women. My um, father also um, got his PhD in agriculture and well, sciences from Michigan State University. He actually came to the U.S. on a cargo ship, you know, essentially without a penny and you know, saved and, and ended up going into um, science. And my sister also is a full professor in astrophysics. My other sister um, in electrical and, and um, ocean engineering. So I think in general, like the, the main kind of message is you can move around a lot. And so I, I was in the industry, United Technologies, which is now merged with Raytheon, worked on fuel cells as well as a lot of other areas. Um, and then having an impact, I think is one of the major drivers. Um, and so coming to government and being able to really not just do the research, but help to you know, strategically define what should our direction be how could we really you know, catalyze the R&D, get the market going? So when I started in hydrogen and fuel cells you know, years ago, decades ago, um, it was you know, ramping up, um, but then it had its various hype cycles. And so I think now is when we're seeing just a lot more interest in, in hydrogen. It's starting to be much more commercially uh, widespread. So anyway, to answer your question, um, you know, come a, a long way, a lot of different things, seen it from different angles. And um, didn't, you know, the director started out being the storage on this hydrogen storage team, ended up being, you know, chief and team leader, then chief engineer, then you know, acting director. And so, again, um, you, you, you never know where you're going to end up, but it's been, you know, very rewarding. Absolutely. And I really appreciate kind of the, the in-depth you went there talking about your family and, and inspirations. And I feel like a lot of students, both in the PUEA, which is the Princeton Energy Association, I know some members listen to this and elsewhere listening to this, wondering how they can get into these technologies in this field. So I appreciate that. One, one thing actually, sorry, Owen, I was going to mention that because I get this question a lot, but because uh, I've had a lot of, you know, hundreds of um, employees, staff, and students also in the past, and sometimes they were very career focused. And I would always say, you know, you can't build a tree house without a tree. And so having a really strong foundation, whether it's, you know, economics or art or history or science, 
you know, really building that muscle. It's like, you know, that hard work and, you know, in-depth uh, knowledge of your field and passion for your field, I think is really where, where I see people make a difference. And so thanks again for, you know, you guys even doing this is really um, noteworthy. So thanks again. Absolutely. And, and for those uh, not quite as steeped in the energy world, hydrogen is not necessarily the, the buzzword for energy that we're thinking of today. So hydrogen as a, as a whole is, is number one in the atomic element table, and it's the simplest and most abundant element on Earth. So in your own words, how exactly does hydrogen energy work? And could you possibly help explain why there's so much interest in in hydrogen at the moment and fuel cell technologies. Yeah, sure. So I think you know one of the main reasons, and it's true, like you said, it's the most abundant element in the universe. Three quarters of the known universe is hydrogen, but on Earth, it's not really found, you know, plentiful as free hydrogen. It's found in other compounds like water, H2O. And so it's an energy carrier. You do need to make it. But one of the reasons it's, um, you know, of interest is the versatility. So many people call hydrogen the Swiss army knife of energy because you can use it, you can make it from many different resources. Take water, you can split water with you know, a couple of volts of water, uh, hydrogen, oxygen, fossil fuels, biomass, and then you can use it in many different applications. And so most of the hydrogen today in the US, we, we make about um, 10 million metric tons of hydrogen, about one seventh of the global supply. And we use it mostly for petroleum refining and fertilizer production, but it's really a chemical commodity. You can, you know, again, use it for, for many different things, transportation. Um, and the other reason hydrogen is also of interest is it has very high energy content. It's actually three times more than the energy in, let's say, gasoline or conventional fuels like natural gas, gasoline but that's on a weight basis. Actually, that's why NASA uses hydrogen. So it has very high energy content, but on a, a volume basis, because it is a gas, you have to compress it or liquefy it. So it has low energy on a volumetric basis. So it's not, it has pros and cons there, but uh, another reason there's a lot of interest in hydrogen is that um, you, can, you can use hydrogen to store energy. And so especially with the increase in renewables, um, you can use you know, solar, wind, um, store, produce hydrogen from an electrolyzer and then store that, that uh, energy as hydrogen and then use it, either you know, convert it back to electricity or use it for a number of, of end uses. So in transportation, again, in you know, many different applications. So that's one of the, the main reasons that you know, hydrogen is getting you know, so much interest these days. And of course, um, the, there's no carbon, so there's no CO2 emissions. If you burn it, you get H2O. You can use it in a fuel cell, and um, there also you get you know, zero emissions. No, I, I really appreciate that color, and, and you kind of dove into that a little bit in terms of talking about some of the renewable stuff, but the, the hydrogen energy, I believe, can broadly be broken down into color categories. So there's uh, brown, gray, blue, and green hydrogen that I've kind of been learning about through my research. So what, do you guys use that same terminology at the DOE? And, and if you do, would you mind explaining uh, these categories and possibly the differences between these hydrogen types? Sure. And uh, I know some use it. We, we don't really use it too much, but um, there's a lot of talk about the different colors of hydrogen and basically green, the category, um, category for green is when it's, uh, for instance, electrolysis. So there's no CO2, you know, virtually no CO2 emissions. It's just water going to hydrogen and oxygen. And then gray is most of the hydrogen produced you know, in the world today, uh, 70 million um, metric tons is gray hydrogen, it's made from natural gas. And so natural gas is mostly methane, which is CH4, but it has carbon in it. So uh, when you make the hydrogen, it's through a process called steam methane reforming, um, how most of the hydrogen is made. And so you get hydrogen, steam, you know, steam, so water plus natural gas, and then you get um, hydrogen 
but you also get CO2. So uh, it's not completely clean. You have you know, carbon emissions. And so that's termed gray hydrogen. And there's a certain carbon footprint associated with that. And then blue hydrogen is the other term that's being used more and more. And that's when you take um, gray hydrogen and then you capture the CO2. So it's you know, in between gray and green. Um, so you do have you know, some CO2, but you can capture, you know, depending on the situation, you know, 90% that CO2. So that's the term blue hydrogen. So most people are talking about um, you know, blue and green and trying to get away from you know, the gray hydrogen. And then there are various other colors that keep you know, coming up, combinations and so forth. But the, the standard ones are really the, right now that most people are talking about are the green hydrogen and the blue hydrogen and getting away from gray, gray hydrogen. Uh, Dr. Satyapal, could we talk a little bit more about the efficiency and the current stage of production for, for hydrogen? So I did some preliminary research and I could be totally wrong, but it seems that the process of extracting hydrogen from other matters is quite inefficient. So we talked about, you mentioned electrolysis, there's other stuff called steam for reforming, uh, polymer exchange membrane electrolysis, and these would all cause hydrogen to lose around 20 to 30% of the energy uh, from the original energy input. And, and we will hopefully achieve maybe 82 to 86% energy efficiency by 2030, according to some experts. But it seems that you know, this is only just at the production stage and you're losing tons of energy efficiency. And later during the compression and storage process that may result in another round of you know, efficiency loss of around 13 to 40% and such and so on. So uh, maybe I'm completely off on, on those numbers, but I would love to hear your thoughts on how actually efficient and how clean is hydrogen. Yeah, no, that's a great question. And it, it is really important not to overhype um, hydrogen because it's definitely zero emissions from the tailpipe let's say of a vehicle, but you do need to look at the entire you know, pathway. And so um, it's true, you know, it takes energy to produce hydrogen. And like you said, you can be 70% you know, efficient. So if you lose that 30% in the production process, then you need to um, deliver it, you need to store it. If for instance, on vehicles, it's stored as a high pressure gas. And so you need to compress it. And so we look at the you know, entire pathway, but one of the, the main reasons that the total, we call it well to wheels uh, efficiency or well to wheels emissions is good is uh, you, can, you can get over 90% reduction in total greenhouse gas emissions with hydrogen fuel cell vehicles compared to today's vehicles. And one reason is the fuel cell is very efficient. And so I actually had, um, as I was mentioning, a, a fuel cell a, a mock up here, the fuel cell, if we can see that this is, um, basically how it works is you get hydrogen. This is a membrane. So you were talking about, Tiger, the polymer uh, electrolyte membrane. And so this is a, a membrane. And it basically you have hydrogen that goes in on one side and then you have oxygen. So the air basically comes in on the other side. And so what happens is this is a carbon paper basically with a catalyst, platinum based catalyst. And so when hydrogen goes in, it gets basically converted to protons, which goes through the membranes. The key is the membrane. Electrons don't go through because otherwise you'd have a short circuit. And then the protons go through and then combine with the uh, air, the oxygen in the air to produce water. And so that's the only emissions, just water. So this size, I mean, this is uh, scalable, modular, it's small enough to you know, power your laptop. You stack these. The largest in the world is in Korea, about 60 megawatts. And this size, just to get an idea, is more than enough to power a light bulb. So there's you know, that much in terms of power density. And so, but the key really is that it's much more efficient than combustion. So if you think about your you know, vehicle today, you have an internal combustion engine, you waste a lot of that uh, energy and the fuel is heat. You, know, you basically have a flame inside and so it's not very efficient. So because you have no combustion here. You're, you're producing electricity directly. It's an electrochemical reaction like a battery. So it's much more efficient. So even though you have a lot of losses on the hydrogen side, you know, production, delivery, storage, you can make up for a, a lot of that because the fuel cell is so efficient. So when you look at the, um, so where, you know, you can be two to three times uh, more efficient 
um, compared to, for instance, you know, conventional uh, vehicles. And so, um, again, when you look at that total life cycle or, you know, well to wheels, including production, all those losses, delivery, storage, um, and then on the vehicle fuel cells. And if you look at the total emissions, um, you're, again, you know, 90 percent reduction in emissions compared to today's gasoline vehicle. So, again, that, that's one of the... Um, the hard, it's, it's hard to explain, but you're exa exactly right that you can't only look at the tailpipe being zero. You really have to look at um, you know, every single step. And that's why you know, improving the efficiencies as well as reducing the cost is really important for, for each of those steps. Um, but you know, I think what a lot of industry uh, players see is that if you have zero emissions, primary energy like renewables, um, or, or nuclear, then the efficiency losses are maybe not, you know, as important. Of course, it still impacts you in terms of cost and so forth, but at least you don't have additional emissions associated with that. Does that make sense? That absolutely makes sense. And thinking about uh, the emissions versus kind of the benefits here. So people were very excited about the potential for zero emissions hydrogen in the early 2000s. Many industry observers at that time had extremely high expectations. Several European company or countries poured millions of dollars into new energy sources, uh, new hydrogen energy sources, and, and companies sprung up out, out of nowhere um, to raise dollars but were crushed a few short years later. So why is this new interest in hydrogen different from this previous cycle? We're seeing a tremendous amount of interest in companies like Nikola, uh, companies like um, Plug Power, I believe is a hydrogen company. So why is there this intense interest and in, in how is this different from the previous cycle of interest that was maybe 15, 20 years ago? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great question. And um, I think one of the main reasons is, well, there's several reasons, but I think one is just the, the policy drivers that we're seeing, especially in certain countries. So, um, you know, some countries or some regions are really pushing for to be carbon neutral by 2050 and, you know, emissions reductions is a, is a big driver. Um, the other reason is we're seeing such a big penetration of renewables. And so um, the cost has come down a lot. So you can get, you know, three cents a kilowatt hour now. And so that makes producing green hydrogen a lot cheaper. So the cost of what we've been funding, for instance, electrolyzers, fuel cells for you know, a couple of decades now, significant R&D and industries really driven down the cost. So the other reason is, you know, the technology is becoming commercial. It's becoming competitive. And, um, you know, even with natural gas, we have such low cost natural gas, especially in the US. And so the cost of hydrogen from SMR has, is less than $2 per kilogram. So, you know, one of the, the main reasons um, there's just so much difference now is that the cost is becoming much more competitive than technology is. And in fact, uh, for the first time last year, the entire, you know, industry, the global shipments for fuel cells surpassed one gigawatt. So, um, which is pretty huge in, in the market. And so you mentioned plug power, and you know, they have thousands, 35,000 fuel cell forklifts in the market. We, you know, Japan has a third of a million fuel cells, you know, for home applications, residential fuel cells. This Fukushima, they were really, you know, pushing that reliable power. And so, you know, again, a, a lot of those drivers with the market signals and the fact that it's hard to decarbonize certain sectors, especially like you mentioned, you know, heavy duty trucks, transport. Um, there's also, you know, freight, uh, industrial applications. And so I think a lot of those drivers and one of the, um, the other ones is, is also energy security. So you're seeing countries looking at, um, you know, exporting interest in producing hydrogen and then exporting hydrogen to other countries. And so I think there are just a lot of drivers um, maybe one last one I'll mention, which I think most people don't uh, realize, and, and I didn't you know, realize this until recently, but um, we have never seen like, so much interest from different sectors in the market. So for instance, the nuclear industry is really starting to get interested. So you can understand you know, solar and wind, if you get significant penetration in a region and you've not built out transmission, for instance, then utilities have to curtail that solar or wind. 
which is you know obviously lost revenues. And so you can you can understand why they would be interested in hydrogen to you know produce it for it. Um, but you also see interest um, as renewables increase with nuclear because nuclear can't turn down as easily. They operate as base load. And so they can uh, look at using hydrogen with, you know, basically producing hydrogen with an electrolyzer and then using that hydrogen for other applications, bringing in a different, you know, additional revenue streams. So that's, you know, another example of how we're seeing a lot more interest from the utilities. It's not just, you know, industry like the, you know, the, the automotive or transportation sector that's inter interested in it. So that, that's another big difference compared to before. Yeah, ab absolutely. And I think um, you mentioned this at the beginning, but talking about the price of fossil fuels and how it relates to hydrogen, I'd kind of love to dig into that a little bit more. And also just the, the other parts of the energy mix. And so how exactly do fossil fuel prices affect the cost efficiency or just general efficiencies of um, green hydrogen, or sorry, or of hydrogen as a whole, and then also how do renewables affect the price and, and growth of hydrogen? You kind of mentioned that a little bit in terms of talking about how the, the renewables curtailment and you don't want that, but if you could dive into that a little bit more, that, that would be awesome. Sure, yeah, that's a great, um, a great question because it, it all comes down to cost, as you know, and then you know, ultimately the prices. And so, you know, as I said, with low cost natural gas, um, you know, today's prices, uh, you know, a couple dollars, you know, in the U.S. anyway, uh, um, you know, two to four dollars per million BTU, you can get, you know, really low cost, less than two dollars per kilogram hydrogen, you know, a dollar even. And so uh, we need to be competitive. So DOE sets, you know, targets and industry also, you know, you need to be competitive with that. And so, um, but if you look at the cost of hydrogen from renewables from electrolysis, it depends on you know, two, two main things. One is the capital cost, of course, of the electrolyzer, and then also the cost of electricity and you know, maintenance and so forth. And so what we find is that today, um, if you look at the cost of electrolyzers at low volume, again, people are not, in the US, we only have, you know, we have about 14 megawatts or so of electrolyzers deployed. Um, PEM electrolyzers, um, but th there's a pretty broad range of capital cost, and we're finding that the high end, it's about $1,500 per kilowatt, um, and at that cost, and if you get electricity at like five to six, um, or five to seven cents a kilowatt hour, just to give you an idea, you can be about five to six dollars per, per kilogram of hydrogen. So um, we need to be, if we, if we want to be competitive with um, hydrogen from natural gas, we want to get down to $2 or less. So today, to your question in terms of cost, with electrolyzers, green hydrogen, again, at low volume is about you know, 5 to $6 per kilogram. Um, again, it depends a lot on the cost of electricity. But I think the bottom line is that if you can get to less than around $0.03 cents, Per kilowatt hour for electricity prices and if you can use the electrolyzer again the key is that you need um, very good capacity factors or in other words utilization of the electrolyzer because your levelized cost is what you want to be low so for instance think of if you're using just solar uh, when the sun shines or wind you know, when the wind blows and then use the electrolyzer you're not using that electrolyzer much you have a stranded asset there the utilization is really low so what you'd like to do is be able to use that electrolyzer as continuously as possible, you know, as much as possible, so that um, you know you basically don't have a stranded asset and you don't have all that capex sitting there. So, if you do that, if you can get electricity at less than three cents a kilowatt hour, then you can get less than two dollars per kilogram. So that's kind of our our goal, and get the capex down to our target is about $300 per kilowatt by 2030. So, um, you know, industry feels that maybe they can get there to get, get around $400, $450 a, a kilowatt, but we still need more research. So the key is really, you know, how do we get from $1,500 a kilowatt at low volume down to $300 per kilowatt? That's kind of our, our goal to try to get the cost down. And then of course also have the electricity cost down. So. 
I know that's sort of complicated, but maybe one easy way to think about it is uh, how much energy is needed to electrolyze water. Um, and you know, our, our goal is, you know, just to, to give you round numbers, if you, if you look at about 50 kilowatt hours per kilogram of hydrogen, and let's just make the math easy, let's say you do 10 cents a kilowatt hour. So 10 times 50 is $5 per kilogram. That gives you kind of a rough way of thinking about it, but you know, we need to get the cost down. So either, because you know, it's gonna take so much energy to produce the hydrogen, you can't really change that too much. So either you get the cost of electricity down, we need the cost of electricity to come down, but we also need the capital cost of the electrolyzer to come down. And of course you need your durability and so forth. So, so anyway, so those are just, you know, some ideas, some of you know, where we are in terms of, of cost. So we're not too far off. I think there are a lot of examples and that's partly why industry is really building out the um, capacity for electrolyzers and a lot of potential in terms of reducing cost. The cost stuff is so interesting because all of the reports I'm reading and kind of all the podcasts I'm listening to are, are talking about how it's right on the verge of commercial viability or, or very close in the, in the next few years. And w when people are talking about that, they often point toward solar PV and battery technologies that have had these dramatic sloping curves of, of cost reductions. So in your view, is that a uh, dramatic curve possible for hydrogen? Is there any um, exponential, <laughs> exponential reduction in cost uh, possible for hydrogen? And if not, uh, you did mention that the cost of electrolyzers needing to, to go down a little bit, but do you see that being possible in the coming years? Uh, yes, I, I think, you know, definitely based on everything we've seen, we've already, you know, Reduce the cost with our funding with our DOE, the cost of electrolyzers, you know, 80%, um, fuel cells as well, over 60%, um, you know, quadruple the durability. So, you know, one of the problems is the, the fuel cell, the, the membrane, the catalyst, there are you know, various mechanisms. So, you need to also have it last. For instance, if you're talking about a vehicle, consumers, you know, expect 150,000 miles. And so, there's already been, you know, huge progress, and we've just launched. You may have seen uh, two new consortia announced a hundred million dollars. One of them is called H two New for electrolyzers. Basically, um, we're bringing together the national labs, industry, universities to see how can we drive down the fuel. The electrolyzer is just the reverse, by the way, of the, the fuel cell some electrolyzer. And uh, then what, what we call the million mile fuel cell truck consortium the trucks need to get to a million miles. And so we're putting in that funding to help you know, drive down the cost. And we have seen you know, pretty good learning curves already. The fact that um, these are the forklifts, for instance, are a good market starting to become commercial. And then we've also assessed the cost. You know, every year we do you know, rigorous cost analysis. And since there are commercial vehicles now, for instance, looked at the cost of the fuel cell, um, and even at low volume, um, around $165 a kilowatt is where we are. But if we project that to high volume manufacturing, um, we see you know, around $75 a kilowatt. So uh, to give you an idea of you know, what that, that cost reduction potential, we do see um, possible, both in terms of volume and scale up, as well as you know, uh, platinum is one of the biggest uh, cost drivers here. Uh, but I think there's a lot of potential. So we're, we're uh, hopeful in terms of the R&D that we're supporting. Absolutely. And it sounds like a, a very positive outlook for the next few years, driven by this R&D from the DOE and others. One thing that has been on my mind in terms of the transportation of hydrogen is thinking about, uh, one, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the uh, Australian project to create uh, liquefied hydrogen. I believe they're working with uh, Japan to, to ship over a, a liquefied hydrogen that's similar to liquefied natural gas, um, which I think is, is fascinating. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. And then second, if we're thinking about the transportation of this gas, um, that is not as, as uh, traditional as some other fuel types. So in what ways could you, hydrogen potentially utilize the millions of miles of natural gas pipelines in the US 
and in what ways is more infrastructure spending needed? Like what would that look like if we were to, to build these um, transportation networks for this hydrogen? Is it necessary? What are your general thoughts on that? Okay, great. Well, I can see that you're up on the, um, all the, the research going on. So the Australia project was definitely an exciting one and um, may have seen the, the ship. Um, there's a YouTube video out there also and they commissioned the ship. So there are two, two big projects actually. One, Australia shipping liquid hydrogen to Japan. And um, again, because hydrogen in terms of, even though it has the highest energy content on a mass basis, um, by volume, it's really low. Um, so it's three to four times lower. So in terms of energy density, it is um, much more efficient to ship LNG. Um, but in some, you know, many countries, it's harder to uh, ship the LNG and then have, you know, a reformer and, you know, have the, the plant to produce the hydrogen. And then you have the emissions on, on site and so forth. And they also had issues with, um, you know, the earthquakes and so forth. So their uh, goal was to, you know, ship import uh, hydrogen. And so uh, one of the big challenges, of course, is the temperature. So to liquefy hydrogen, you need, you know, 20 Kelvin. And so you need to keep that cold. They uh, typically, NASA does this, you have vacuum insulation. And so, um, and if you don't, you end up losing the hydrogen, you get boil off. So dormancy is one of the challenges. You know, ultimately, their goal in this project with uh, Shell and Kawasaki and other Iwatani is, it's called the Hystra project, is to be able to fuel the ship. So you have a tanker that's um, transporting the hydrogen and you'll have some boil off. Um, and then you can use that boil off to, you know, to fuel the, the ship also for, for power on the ship. Right now, it's still a diesel ship. So um, still need to look at the total <laughs> emissions across that life cycle. But one other I'll mention is the uh, project from Brunei to Japan. And so there, instead of shipping hydrogen, they're shipping a chemical carrier. And we're also doing research in this space, but it's, um, it's called methyl cyclohexane. It's, it's a chemical carrier that has hydrogen, basically it's bonded to it, it's a liquid organic carrier. So it has much higher density, um, but it is, uh, you know, you can store it at room temperature. It's really easy to transport, and you just need to, you know, dehydrogenate it at the point of use to release the hydrogen, and then you get the chemical that's left over, uh, called toluene, that you can ship back. And so it's kind of a complete cycle. Um, and so that's just a another approach. Uh, another is ammonia. You may have heard the largest green hydrogen project in the world was announced by Saudi Arabia for gigawatts and using solar and you know, renewables and then producing ammonia. So there's also discussion of you know, shipping ammonia. So this whole concept of what's the best way of storing hydrogen, it depends on the application and then using hydrogen, depending on the distance and you know, how are you gonna use it at the end. So I think that's a whole area of you know, research now and um, important. And then the second uh, question in ter terms of pipeline, um, there as well, in fact, we just announced a new um, initiative, over 20 companies are involved. Um, it's called High Blend, and we have, again, our national labs involved and you know, multiple uh, companies and a lot of countries are also looking at um, producing hydrogen, of course, you know, green, green hydrogen. And then if you don't have um, a way to use the hydrogen right away, or if you wanna try to decarbonize your gas grid, injecting it into the pipeline. In fact, the UK, in fact, you may have seen the news just uh, yesterday, I think they started with homes um, using you know, hydrogen in the gas pipeline. And we had you know, decades ago, town gas, you may have heard of town gas or city gas, that was a, you know, a hydrogen already in, in the pipeline. And we have millions of you know, homes with natural gas. So the key though, is there, there are two main issues. One is, um, the material of the pipeline. So certain steels are susceptible to embrittlement, what's called embrittlement. And so there's been some discussion of having liners like an in, in internal sleeve, like a, a fiber reinforced pipe or materials that can withstand the, the hydrogen and um, not have the hydrogen permeate or cause embrittlement. 
And then the second is the end use applications. So depending on the home appliances, or if you're looking at power generation, the turbines and so forth, what percentage uh, hydrogen can be tolerated both within the pipeline and then also in the end use. So those are the kinds of you know, research areas that we're looking at. And uh, companies, you know, countries are very actively looking at blending right now. So uh, one area we're looking at is wh what are the standards? What are the acceptable limits? And there's a range, um, you know, around 15% is what, you know, some of the, the major you know, literature is looking at. And I was actually visiting Germany three years ago, uh, the world's largest wind to hydrogen plants. Um, and it, they were injecting up to the limit there was 10% of hydrogen you know, in the natural gas pipeline. And they were injecting 10% um, for three years. Uh, they had already been injecting or just, you know, just under 10% and didn't have any issues. So, um, so again, I think this, that is definitely an exciting area and with, with a lot of the utilities, you know, gas companies looking at you know, how do they decarbonize you know, that sector, uh, we're gonna see you know, increased um, interest there. So we're, we're very hopeful for, for high blend um, and the collaboration that we have there. Dr. Satyapal, it's just so amazing to hear all those science facts and those interesting stories, places you visited, projects you're in, uh, involved with. But um, one thing that was previously on my mind when I thought about hydrogen uh, technology uh, and fuel cell was the, the hydrogen fuel cell vehicles, uh, which combine hydrogen and oxygen to produce electricity to run a motor. And the range of those vehicles and refueling processes are comparable to a lot of the conventional cars and trucks, so about 200 to 300 miles. Uh, and they only produce water and heat as byproducts, as we previously explained, so they don't have the emissions. Um, I would love to just hear a little bit more of your thoughts on the comparisons between HFCV, hydrogen fuel cell vehicles, and the battery power, the electric uh, vehicles like Tesla, who, who use lithium ion batteries and, and such and so on. What do you see as some of the drawbacks of uh, HFCV? What do you think are some of the advantages? Um, yeah, that's a great question. I know a lot of people say they, they compete, but we really think of a por portfolio. Again, hydrogen is one part of a portfolio. We're going to need baths, you know, battery electric vehicles, um, combustion, you know, biofuels. We're going to need all of them, um, and especially in the near term. And so, you know, basically the advantages with um, fuel cells is, like you said, they refuel very quickly. So you don't have to wait for the charging time just a few minutes. There are about 9,000 commercial fuel cell vehicles now in the US. There are about 25,000 worldwide. In fact, in just one year, the sales were doubled for fuel cell vehicles. Um, and the other advantage, like you said, is range. So if you need you know, long driving range, um, you need you know, very heavy batteries. So the main advantage, again, you, with fuel cells is you're decoupling the power generation source, which is the fuel cell from the hydrogen. So one kilogram of hydrogen, which just a, ha happens to be a coincidence of nature, by the way, one kilogram of hydrogen is equal in energy content to one gallon of gasoline. So you might see that term GGE, gallon gasoline equivalent. But again, because the fuel cell is so efficient, you need um, a lot less hydrogen to go the same amount of you know, distance. So one kilogram of hydrogen can go you know, easily go 60 miles to give you an idea. So, you know, five kil so in your, in your vehicle, in a typical vehicle, you might have five kilograms of hydrogen instead of like 15 gallons of gasoline and you can go 300 miles. So the vehicles now, you know, they're commercial vehicles, they can go you know, 300, 400 miles and without having to refuel. So, and, and it doesn't take that long to refuel. That's one of the main advantages. But of course, the big disadvantage is infrastructure. And that's one of the, the biggest challenges with hydrogen. And, and that's why we have you know, our H2 at scale um, uh, concept or vision, which by the way, is in the background here. Um, you can see the picture of the versatility of hydrogen. And the whole concept is you know, the, the red shows you, you know, today's grid and then the gray, I'm pointing the wrong way here, um, it shows you the gas grid. And the blue shows if you, once you produce hydrogen, you can use it, you can see all the bubbles uh, in all these different applications, hydrogen plus CO2, liquid fuels, or put it back to the grid. So, uh, so anyway, the, the biggest challenge is really the, the infrastructure, the cost, you know, I think we're, 
getting down in terms of cost. I think most of the um, industry stakeholders feel, you know, cost might be manageable. It still needs work. So we still need to reduce cost quite a bit at the storage and the fuel cell and so forth. But the biggest challenge really is the infrastructure. So, you know, we don't have uh, stations. We have, we have 45 stations in the U.S. Um, we have about 470, almost 500 stations worldwide. But, you know, compared to, you know, many, many thousands of, of gasoline stations, it, it's that, that capital cost and that investments to put in stations, to put in the infrastructure. There are two, you know, a couple of different pathways. Pipelines, you know, having gaseous stations, and then you have to compress it to refuel, or you can transport liquid to the station, and that's much higher, you know, energy density. Um, you know, four to over four times more than transporting gas. But anyway, either either one is expensive, and so that's the biggest the biggest challenge: the the cost, the infrastructure, the, the refueling, and um, I think that's that's one challenge. But I should mention, in case you had not seen, we did have um, a, in the we did have legislation called the H Prize, and we did have a competition for a small scale fueler. So anyone, you know, any company that can come up with just taking, you know, water, um, water, electricity, and then producing in a self-contained unit, if you don't have, you know, a lot of vehicles. Um, and we did announce the winner. It's a company called Simple Fuel. And so they actually am exporting to Japan even now. And we're going to get a Simple Fuel. This is our station in Washington, D.C., in the background here, by the way. Um, we had to decommission it, but we, it was a project and we had, you know, state cars here in DC and we're getting the simple fuel units. So to your point on infrastructure is not there yet. And the problem is that, you know, it's hard to invest in stations, which are, you know, really expensive, you know, over a million dollars when we don't have enough vehicles. And so the idea behind this, you know, H price winner, the simple fuel or similar units is that, um, you don't need that huge capex and investments when you have a small number of vehicles for a forklift. And so that's kind of one of the stepping stones, one, one idea. And with H2S scale, the concept is really how do we co-locate large scale production and then multiple end uses so we can drive down the cost and you know, get that infrastructure, that critical mass of infrastructure. So we have you know, projects now, I can talk about in Texas, we have the first marine the first passenger ferry, uh, 150 passengers in uh, California. So we'll have an electrolyzer on a floating barge, produce hydrogen, refuel the ferry, and also a battery um, vessel that we can charge. Um, another a data center project with Microsoft and uh, steel manufacturing. So a lot of examples, basically the point is, how do we ramp up scale so that we can get you know, local infrastructure that can help drive down cost. Uh, Dr. Satyapa, you really gave a very comprehensive overview from the vehicles themselves to infrastructure, but, but I guess just to very quickly follow up on that, you, I, I remember you quickly mentioned that US has around 45 uh, hydrogen charging stations. I, I think Japan is one of the leading nations in hydrogen innovation, as you mentioned, but even so, I think it merely wants to have around 160 hydrogen stations and 40,000 uh, hydrogen fuel cell vehicles in the country by like 2021. And, and, and in, in China, I think uh, they announced something like uh, $23 billion of investments by 2023. Uh, but like right now in China, there's like 20, 25 hydrogen stations. So it seems that the infrastructure is a big challenge there. And it seems that every country seems to be at somewhat of the same level, which is uh, wildly, um, insufficient compared to the vision we might eventually want to achieve. So I guess my, my long-winded way of going to the question is, how do you see the cross-country comparison when it comes to hydrogen innovation, technology, the progress being made? Um, how would you assess that front? So, you know, definitely there's a lot of uh, synergy, um, but there are differences. And if you look at some of the drivers, um, for some of them, for instance, instance, you know, countries like Australia, Chile, which um, is, you know, very, uh, very, very interested in hydrogen now, they aim to be the first developing country that would be carbon neutral by 2050. And they see, you know, resource availability as a big driver. So, you know, for Australia, Chile using, for instance, solar, producing hydrogen, exporting hydrogen, 
Um, that's one of their big drivers. And then you have other countries like South Africa, for instance, um, they are really interested, especially in terms of their resources. So they're the world's largest supplier of platinum. And platinum is you know, one of the main catalysts that's used in the fuel cell. And so they're very interested and have you know, pretty aggressive uh, hydrogen uh, fuel cell strategy. And then you have uh, Europe, again, you know, driven by uh, a lot of their you know, decarbonization goals. Germany has announced major plans. Uh, France as well, and so they have targets in terms of gigawatts of electrolyzers, you know, green hydrogen, and then of course Japan, uh, Korea, especially in the, the transportation side, um, countries like Japan, Korea, you know, 95% of their energy. So uh, they're also those are some of the different drivers. So I think they're they're all there's some you know similarities, um, but then there are also you know differences based on their geographical. Um, and you know, resource availability situation. So, but in terms of um, innovation, I would say that you know, the US has been a leader for, for going back to the space program. We actually started our you know, fuel cell efforts in the 1970s when in the first uh, oil embargo, then it was about energy security and how do we you know, reduce dependence on, on foreign oil? That was the big driver then. And that was when DOE was actually formed. And most people don't realize this, but um, a group from, we had a, a workshop with Los Alamos, a lot of the labs, and a group from uh, GM actually relocated to Los Alamos. And um, after that, and then the labs developed some of the uh, breakthrough work on, a, this is called a membrane electrode assembly or MEA is the term. And so that is what you know really helped to advance uh, progress in the field. And so again, I think there's a lot of innovation we have just from our funding alone over a thousand patents, um, and we're starting to see interest in terms of the market. So you mentioned you know plug power, uh, we we have Cummins, you know we have a lot of you know acquisitions in terms of electrolyzer companies. We're seeing the companies become you know more vertically integrated. They want to have access not just to the you know, fuel cells, but the the whole value change of so the hydrogen production. We have you know, great example success story. We funded um, Nebraska, in fact, for hydrogen storage tanks, um, and so they're exporting. So I think there's a lot of innovation and a lot of potential. But you're absolutely right that you know other countries are definitely stepping up in terms of investments, and but a lot of the companies really are global. So I think we'll start to see some synergies. They're going to start going where you know we see the market. There was a U.S. industry report that was done, and we've also done some of our own analysis, looking at the market potential for hydrogen, the demand potential, and you know, economically today, as I said, we produce 10 million metric tons, but see the potential for two to four times higher in the U.S. So I think that's going to also help you know drive the, the industry and the opportunity here in the U.S. So one big piece of the U.S. puzzle, uh, according to some podcasts and, and places that I've been paying attention to over the last few weeks, is the public policy piece of it. So public policy in the past for hydrogen technologies and, and for hydrogen has received some level of bipartisan support. What do you think is the reason for this ability to get behind hydrogen and how do you see that potentially playing out moving forward? Yeah, no, thank you, Owen. And uh, it is true, I think, again, the fact that um, it's so versatile, you can produce it, again, from you know, either renewables or nuclear or fossil fuels. Um, I think that's part of the reason. And then also just, you know, again, there's just so much uh, benefit. Um, you can use it in multiple applications across sectors. You have a lot of constituents that um, you know, see value in it from their specific regions. And again, it's so, um, in many ways, it's, it, you know, it unites uh, a lot of the different um, energies, you know, applications, as well as, you know, your transportation industry, industrial buildings. It's, it can really touch virtually every, um, you know, opportunity. I think, I think that's one of the main reasons. And um, economically as well, so the potential for innovation, if you look at the entire value chain, you have suppliers, you know, components like um, membranes, the, the catalyst, all the way to complete systems. 
systems integration. And one other area um, also I should mention, a uh, benefit of the electrolyzer is the dynamic response it can provide. In fact, we did for the first time um, couple a couple of solar um, and also an EV charger. So as you know, when you have you know, fast charging, that can cause a lot of fluctuations and issues with the grid. And so um, because the electrolyzer can respond very quickly to signals, it can help compensate for those fluctuations in the grid or provide um, grid services. So that's another example of where it also provides benefits to utilities. So I think you know we'll we'll see um, continued support for hydrogen. Again, if you look at you know completely zero emissions um, or opportunity for very low emissions, the energy security, domestic resources, the job potential, the innovation. Again, there's so many advantages there um, that it really brings together uh, communities across the board. One interesting piece in kind of the global sense, and uh, whenever you need to hop off, just let me know. Sorry, I'm having fun asking these questions. Okay. Um, but whenever you need to go, just say like last question and we'll wrap okay. it up. Um, but one interesting piece that I've been thinking about a lot in an academic sense is how different energy types help developing countries. So obviously there's, there's different injustices that have been done to developing countries in the past with, with great regard to energy and, and fossil fuel sources. And, and one thing moving forward that a lot, of the, um, a lot of academics today are focusing on is how to bring developing countries into, into the 21st century in an, in an equitable way. So what opportunities are there for developing countries in hydrogen and how might those be more advantageous to them than other energy sources? I know you mentioned Chile earlier as just an example, but um, there's there's lots of cool things going on, I believe. Yeah, and uh, and again, yeah, I think, and that's a great question. I think there are a couple of different examples. Like one is, of course, the the resource, um, you know, energy security, uh, resiliency is another one as well. Um, and then the fact that you can produce hydrogen from you know, virtually in any region, from almost any, any resource, or waste, um, biomass. Um, I, I think that, you know, as opposed to you know, importing your energy, that's one of the, the main reasons and the main opportunities. Of course, cost is still high. So I think that's going to be important to get the cost down. Um, and so, I, and again, depending on the, the region, I think there, there are a number of uh, developing countries that are very interested in hydrogen as well. And so both from the technology perspective, if they can end up being you know, a supplier, there's a lot of innovation potential there, manufacturer, but then also just the, the use of the, the hydrogen. So um, I think you know, the fuel cell also for stationary applications, um, you know, I mentioned after Fukushima, for instance, Japan really invested heavily and, and they have you know, a third of a million fuel cells. Um, and, and in fact, the, the New York, and I grew up in New York, but the World Trade Center has fuel cells for reliable power. So even during Hurricane Sandy and so forth, we had in our own uh, Recovery Act here in the US, uh, we helped to deploy fuel cells for backup power for cell phone towers. So in terms of resiliency, that's actually one market that we're seeing a lot of interest in in, in uh, developing countries. So trying to keep the power on um, in certain, you know, for certain critical critical loads, um, and that's where you know fuel cells plus being you know zero emissions, um, but not relying on conventional fuels is another one. I think one um, holy grail in some ways would be is if you could have a reversible fuel cell, and we started working on this as well. But especially when you think about some of our um, early work uh, with cell phone towers, which are sometimes in remote locations. And imagine if you just could um, fill it with water, so you don't need to get fuel to it, um, and then basically have an electrolyzer, so solar, for instance, whatever's available, uh, produce the hydrogen and then run it in reverse, so when you need the power, you could you know, use the, the fuel cell so, and store the hydrogen you know, to, to have more fuel. Um, so that's one example. So I think there are you know, a number of, number of examples where there are benefits for developing countries. Um, but again, energy security, resiliency, those are some of the key ones. 
and then obviously jobs and the economic potential for hydrogen across you know, all applications, across all sectors. So there are, uh, and I would say maybe one last thing also, Owen, is the just uh, island nations. So when you have that water resource availability and um, you know, potentially more difficulty in importing fuel or reliance on external imports, there also I think there's a lot of opportunity but it really depends on cost. And so again, I think it's really important in all cases, we have to drive the cost down and you know, make these you know, really competitive. Um, so I think that is one challenge if there's you know, over hype in terms of hydrogen now, um, it's, it's, it's still not quite there yet. I mean, there's a lot of potential and it is starting to become commercially viable in a lot of markets. But I think maintaining that momentum and, and you know, getting the cost down, keeping an eye on the innovation is all really, really critical for, for us to succeed and for us to you know, really start seeing the impact and the benefit um, of hydrogen and fuel cells. Absolutely. That, that certainly makes sense. And I appreciate all the color in the developing countries. I know I'm very focused on that kind of as a, as a research interest, but it was lovely to hear your thoughts there. Um, now kind of moving back to the U.S., and I promise this is my last question, but um, so you've mentioned this a few times. We kind of talked about some of the, the private sector dynamics. You, you yourself have experience in the private sector, and there are companies that are uh, having huge gains both on the stock market and in terms of market penetration in terms of um, their ability to, to get hydrogen, hydrogen out to the public. So... Uh, Again, you, you have mentioned this in, in terms of specific examples, but in general, how much exchange occurs between the private and public sectors for hydrogen energy? And how much of your work involves private companies and, and different funding opportunities there? So uh, we fund, you know, as, as uh, you mentioned, um, the budget now in our office is 150 million. And so we fund um, national labs, we fund universities and companies. And so what we do is we have funding opportunity announcements, so grants essentially, and we go out and we request, for instance, with the million mile or the H2MU uh, or other areas, hydrogen storage. So it's, it's such a broad portfolio. So we cover production, delivery, storage, fuel cells, demonstrations. So I mentioned, you know, the first, the marine project and data centers, and we have four nuclear hydrogen projects um, in Texas and Florida, we're doing a solar to um, hydrogen projects. So, you know, these clusters, so we, we have a lot of funding that goes out and we definitely encourage teams. And so we have, um, you know, obviously industry well, commercializer is key. So we provide funding to industry and then industry typically cost shares. This is statutory, in fact, so they have to cost share their research like 20% and then demonstrations 50%. So there's, you know, skin in the game there. It's not just a grant. Um, and there's a you know, vested interest in seeing this succeed. And so we, what we also do is we have a consortium model where we have our national labs. As you may know, DOE uh, is the main, you know, um, federal agency responsible for energy R&D in the U.S. And we have multiple offices, we provide funding, and we have stewardship over 17 national laboratories. So Princeton have one there. And um, we have, you know, it's amazing capabilities. There are 50 Nobel Prize winners. We have uh, synchrotrons, you know, lots of unique capabilities. And so our consortium model, which we're doing also for H2MU and the Million Mile Fuel Cell Truck Consortium, is to provide these unique resources and fund the national labs and have these core capabilities and then bring in universities and industry to work with the national labs to really move the needle and you know, drive success. We have concrete targets on what's needed to be competitive. And so um, to your question on in terms of industry, we're, we work with industry all the time. And we have a number of partnerships, uh, specific partnerships, the H2F scale consortium. We have a partnership called the 21st Century Truck uh, Partnership, uh, US Drive. Um, and so, again, we get input from industry on what targets are, you know, what, what are the targets needed to be competitive. So in the U.S., we don't have, you know, mandates in terms of, you know, X thousand vehicles or, you know, X hundred stations um, like other countries do. Instead, we're very market driven. So we really focus on 
uh, what's needed to be competitive, we fund the R&D and, um, and, and some demonstrations and then catalyze the market. So, you know, we, we get the market penetration based on what was competitive. So to answer your question in general, you know, we work with industry very, very closely and through um, mostly a competitive process. So they submit proposals, uh, they're evaluated based on a number of criteria, and then we encourage teaming that we don't have, you know, in, in, in our, in my office, which is applied research, as opposed to you know, really basic fundamental research, uh, teaming that so we bring in universities, national labs, companies working together to, you know, move the needle and, you know, so everyone's in the same boat, rowing in the same direction, the same river, so to speak. So industry is a very integral part of, you know, everything that we do. I know we've talked uh, f for a long time, Dr. Satya, but is there anything else on your mind that you feel somewhat compelled to convey to our listeners before we, we wrap up? Because uh, usually at the end of our show, we, we do ask two quick questions. One is, what would be your contrarian view that, that you might hold that some, uh, someone else in the industry or most others in the industry might disagree with? Uh, another is, what would be your policy punchline? Uh, since the name of our show is Policy Punchline. So what would be some of the takeaways you, you wish our listeners um, walk away from? Yeah, I think, you know, basically, as you said, there's a lot of investment now in hydrogen. There's just a lot of interest. I don't think we've ever seen it in all my years. I don't think I've seen this much interest in investments. So I think in terms of the contrarian view, um, you know, it's, it's, we still need to get there. <laughs> there. There is a lot of hope for hydrogen. But we're not quite there yet. We still need to get the cost down. And I would say in terms of um, takeaways, we do have a lot of international partnerships as well. So these are global companies with a lot of collaboration internationally. And in fact, one um, is, is called IPHE. There's a lot of resources available there, IPHE.net, International Partnership for Hydrogen and Fuel Cells in the Economy. And there's, you know, early career network. Um, and I, I guess maybe one thing to end with, um, going back uh, in history, when I moved from industry to government, um, hydrogen is just not that well known. Uh, it's starting to change now, but we need more education and outreach. I think there's a lot of misrepresentation and it's just it's just hard to explain. Um, you know, it's not a primary resource. Everybody knows solar, wind, batteries, hydrogen, fuel cells. It's just very, it's just one level <laughs> more uh, complex. And when I moved um, from industry to governments, some people thought I was moving to NIH, National Institutes of Health. And I was always really perplexed. And um, Owen's looking, for both of you look a little uh, surprised here, <laughs> wondering what I'm going to say, but the reason that they thought I was moving to NIH, they thought fuel cells were the same as stem cells. Yeah. And so, believe it or not, um, so education and outreach is actually one of the barriers that people might not um, realize. So I think your type of work is, you know, really critical, both in terms of policymakers and the general public. How would you recommend our listeners to follow your work, the work uh, about hydrogen at Department of Energy or, or beyond? Um, anything so you recommend? In, in terms of following the, the work? Yeah, uh, or, or learning more about uh, hydrogen. Um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, going to hydrogen.energy.gov is the website. And um, I think maybe one other fun fact uh, to leave people with, especially for the, the geeks and in us is uh, hydrogen, as you said, is the first elements of the periodic table. So the atomic weight of hydrogen is 1.008. So 10-8 or October 8th is designated National Hydrogen and Fuel Cell Day. What? And so believe it or not, um, it's the only element with its own you know, atomic weight day. Um, and it is, was actually passed by Congress, a resolution, thanks to our fuel cell industry um, association. So That's good five lobbying. years ago, the resolution was passed by Congress and there's the Congressional Caucus on it. And we do, um, you know, media, um, national press club events, ride and drives. We took the car to the Smithsonian and um, museum and um, New Jersey is also, by the way, very, very supportive of hydrogen. So there's the hydrogen house 
there, completely run on, you know, with solar, completely zero um, energy home, which also has a hydrogen vehicle. So I would say in terms of your question on um, how to follow hydrogen, I think there's a lot of you know, new material out there and maybe you can uh, host an event uh, next year for National Hydrogen Day. Absolutely. Thank you so much for ending on such positive note and, and for uh, telling us so much about this industry. Uh, th thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Satyapal. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, thank you. I, I, and this concludes this episode of Policy Punchline. Please visit us on policypunchline.com. You may watch the full video on, on our YouTube channel, which uh, Dr. Satyapal does a wonderful job in uh, explaining some of the mechanisms uh, with her background. And also, uh, um, uh, so we'd love to have you watch the video and you can always listen to our episodes on iTunes, Spotify. Um, thank you so much for listening today. You've been listening to Policy Punchline, a podcast generously supported by the Julius Rabinowitz Center for Public Policy and Finance at Princeton University. We would also like to encourage you to follow other podcasts produced by Princeton University, such as Politics and Polls by the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs. Policy Punchline is intended to be informational only and does not reflect nor represent the views of Princeton University or the Julius Rabinowitz Center for Public Policy and Finance. For more information on subscription, donation, volunteering, or contact, please visit policypunchline.com. Thank you again for listening.